Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Brendan Teal, and great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Dublin City Council to this event as part of the Dublin Festival of History. The festival is in, this is the 11th year, and it's brought to you uh, to the hard work of Dublin City Libraries and Dublin City Council Culture Company. This is the last event of this evening, but of course we have lots more tomorrow here in Dublin Castle, and then in our branches and other venues around the city over the next two weeks. And I suggest you check out Dublin City Dublin Festival of History.ie for the latest updates because there is more updated information on that. We have a treat for you tonight. Um, back in 1976, I was a, a young teenager just getting into music, Rory Gallagher, Thin Lizzy, and a fantastic album called The Book of Invasions, which came out that year. And of course, this is often the way, having heard The Book of Invasions, I went back through the back catalogue and arrived back uh, three years earlier to the album we're going to talk about tonight, The Toyn, by, of course, Horse Lips. I think that looks absolutely fantastic to see that uh, sleeve up there uh, so large. So uh, we're delighted to have, uh, in order to, to, to mark the 50th anniversary of the release of The Toyn, we have Jim Lockhart and Barry Devlin from Horse Lips, and they're going to be moderated. I don't know if she's going to sit between the two of them uh, and keep them in order, but uh, the legendary broadcaster, Diren Nevereen, that's the slight change in the program that you may have seen. So look, we're in for a treat, really going to enjoy it. And will you please welcome, along with Darren Yvreen, Jim Lockhart and Barry Devlin from Horses. <laughs> to see you all here. I'm, I'm kind of scanning the room. I, I can never tell with women. I'm looking at the men's heads to see how many might be kind of survi survivors of our vintage <laughs> and how many might be people who have come since then. But I think there are probably enough of the, uh, of I, the survivors. I thought you were scanning here. the room to see if there were any people there that we didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we don't know you, uh, would you mind standing up and identifying? <laughs> now, the hard question I won't ask, first of all, need I introduce Jim Lockhart and Barry Devlin. Thanks, Barry. <laughs> And can, can we say thank you very much to Darren for doing this? Yeah. No, you're more welcome. More than, more than welcome. <laughs> um, we, we, the three of us go back a very, very long way. And um, you don't need to know any more than that. We, 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 we met each other <coughs> rather young. Um, what I thought we might do at the beginning, because, you know, you might, the old memory might not be the greatest, is to, since we're here, to celebrate and to talk about the coin and Horselip's interpretation of it, we might ask them to briefly run through what the story of the coin is, in case any of you might have forgotten, because that, after all, is central to the album. Yeah. So. Um, Off you go, then. OK, well, look. You wrote, we, we, you, we you wrote it, it says here. <laughs> <laughs> we had notes. Uh, we had notes on the album. So we might as well dip into these a wee bit. Um, because there would be people kind of watching online and stuff who wouldn't, who wouldn't necessarily all be familiar with it. So um, Eamon's first intro to it says, Ireland's most exciting saga is undoubtedly the Toyn, the centrepiece of the Ulster cycle of heroic tales, um, deal dealing with the conflict between the forces of Connacht and Ulster for the possession of a prize bull, estimated to have taken place about 500 BC in Ireland. And the earliest written version known to us is in the Book of the Dun Cow from the 12th century. And before that, the story was kept alive by storytellers. Two other manuscript versions are also available. The Book of Leinster from the 12th century <coughs> and the Yellow Book of Lecan from the 14th century. Um, and it's seen as Ireland's equivalent of the Aeneid. Uh, and 
uh, that's the kind of basic stuff of it. And naturally, it features Cú Cullen, the great hero, um, reinvented uh, largely by Avid as, as a Marvel comic hero. Uh, and uh, the, the doings of Queen Maeve and the army of Connacht. Yeah, and the, the bizarre uh, sleep that had been put upon the Ulster men, which by and large has prevailed to this day. <laughs> but <coughs> it, uh, so, so it was, you know, it, 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 the town is about Cúcullin, but it, it's not at all about Cúcullin. It's about the two, it's about the culture. It's about uh, Queen Maeve and Alil are extraordinary characters. Uh, Ferdy himself is an extraordinary character. The relationship between uh, between Ferdy and Cullen has been the subject of a, a good deal of modernist speculation. I think they just <laughs> liked fighting, but hey, who knows? Uh, and so, so the, the, there's more to the town in a way than Cullen. Although Cullen's health was central to the town's begetting, as Jim will will explain at some point later on. Um, and I, yeah, well, that's so, uh, but you could kind of know that um, Maeve, bull, Barry, Maeve had a, had, had a, 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 a white bull, <laughs> and or Ali, her husband, had a white bull, and, and they had a row in bed one night, uh, hence her words were sharp, they cut him deep in a war between the sheets, uh, about who had the best possessions. And Ali was, was up for his white bull, and Maeve figured she needed one a bit just like that, and she knew where there was one. And so she headed off for Ulster to take the, the dun, the brown bull of Cooley. Uh, and, I mean, the dun literally is a brown bull, but there's also uh, a suggestion that he was a god of the dead. So there, there's, there's always stuff sort of metaphorically creeping into, into the, the... There's a lot of connotation along with the denotation of, of the story. And I really wanted to get connotation and denotation in early, <laughs> so, so that it <coughs> obsessed me for the rest of the night. But so, so kind of that, that it, on one level, it's, it's a bunch of guys coming to steal a very large bull. On another level, it's about, a, it's about and, it, and, and in a very valid one, it's about cultures pitted against each other. And there's, you know, it, again, it Maeve against the men of Ulster, you know, a, a warrior queen. Um, a thing that was to continue, uh, you know, right up to Grania Whale, and it's it's a tradition, um, and um, that w that's, is that enough, that's, Ed? That's, that's the first time I've heard the sleeping sickness being adduced as a, a reason for the suspension of Stormont. <laughs> 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 but I take my hat off to you, sir. Well, I am I am I am clear about that. That that is what it is. It's <laughs> and I read somebody talking about this who who said that. Um, uh, mythic heroes tend to be androgynous, and so that kind of homoerotic element between Ferdia and Cucullin, or between Cucullin and Ferdia, because we don't know if it was reciprocated, um, that that was, well, no, it was reciprocated, wasn't it? Yeah, but that, that wasn't that uncommon uh, uh, a feature of yeah. myth, apparently, and um, they tend, like mythic heroes, tended to be uh, sneered at in their in their youth as being too ladylike, and um, then they went out and just killed a lot of people to prove it. <laughs> well, I was about to say we are at a history festival, mm. and we I m maybe this is the same in most countries where there are myths, as as all countries have their myths, but we we do treat myth as history very often. You know, we, we it was taught to us in school as history. I mean, it's in the history books. <laughs> It's, it's extraordinary because like you have from the earliest times to the flight of the earls and the flight of the earls to the present day with was the two halves That's right. and it began with the Milesians coming ashore in Kerry uh, and the Fir Bullock uh, and it was only kind of much later you started to think Fir Bullock that's the bell guy who turned up in Julius Caesar who were in Belgium uh, and then there's uh, there's various other kind of uh, it's only recently I, I, I discovered that Milesians is Miles, Mil Espoin is a Spanish soldier. Miles uh, Espoin. Oh, in Latin, yeah. Um, and so Milesians. Well, appear, they did come from Galicia. They came, didn't they they? came from Spain, apparently. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> all, the, all the early myths point to 
the earliest uh, invaders, not invaders, but the earliest immigrants to Ireland coming from the Middle East, from Greece specifically. Mm. Um, and uh, De Danan is, Danan is actually a Greek plural genitive. Um, so there's debate about that, but I think it's highly unlikely that somebody could be called the Tuha De Danan and not be related to the goddess Dana, Dana yeah. um, of whom the genitive is Danan. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's, there's all sorts of Greek connections. And if you remember um, Bob uh, Quinn's uh, documentary, Donkeys, years ago, oh, about yeah. uh, the, the connections African between connection. North Africa and Ireland. I'm going to turn this phone off. I'm going off. to pull Apologies. you out of that rabbit hole now, interesting and all as it is. <laughs> 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 because but I like my rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's fascinating. But, uh, but again, we're back to, you know, do the Malaysians exist or do they not? What evidence have we? Anyway. Well, as far as we're to, to, be, to, be, to be, sorry, to be concise about it then, um, the, the argument appears, to, not an argument, but there is a kind of tension between two interpretations. One is that this is, uh, that the Thoin is a medieval uh, work of literature uh, written by monastic authors as a work of art uh, and that it, it, it exists in that context um, and that it doesn't really, and that there isn't, uh, a kind of a, an Iron Age mave, and that there isn't an Iron Age story going on, that it's, a, that, it's, that it's something that was written then. On the other hand, if you look at it, there's a whole lot of stuff about chariots, and it reflects an Iron Age way of thinking, a pre-Christian way of thinking, you would think. Um, yeah. And th there's an odd thing that, despite all the chariots that are going on, and everybody's running around in chariots in the town, there's no archaeological evidence of chariots in Ireland. And apparently the archaeological maxim is that absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. Um, so that doesn't mean that there weren't any chariots, but it'd be kind of interesting if there had been the odd chariot dug up in a mound, but there hasn't been. Yeah. So it may very well be that this is actually uh, an orally transmitted, uh, as we always kind of thought, an orally transmitted uh, Iron Age tale of chariots running around in Gaul and in Britain, because they had chariots in Britain, but they don't seem to have had them here. So there's, there's two, it either was 500 BC or 1000 or 1500 BC, or it was solely medieval. I don't know if, I don't know if you can come down strictly on either mm. of those. Mm. Well, one way or the other, I think we could assume that it was a story that was told, retold, retold, altered, mm. and okay, it was written down 12th century, was it? Thereabouts. Yeah, <coughs> and then that subsequently, there were all sorts of other translations, retellings, and around the time, or just before horse lips came on the scene, that was when <laughs> Thomas, <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> to do a quick leap in history, that was when Thomas Kinsella's translation mm. of Thorne appeared, and so, there was a whole curiosity in the air about it around that time, with, with, with illustrations by Louis Lebrocchi. Some of you might remember that, that publication, it was, it was gorgeous. But was that, I mean, you heard about it at school, you did too, Barry, but was, w did that have an influence on, on the band, the, the, uh, the on Eamon Carr, for instance, and the, yep. the others in the band? Yep. Yeah, no, it absolutely would. I mean, you know, I, 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 I was immediately aware of the book because it looked like a, it looked like a set of Rosa tests, you know. Be, uh, <laughs> uh, what, do you, what do you see with, with those blots? And, but it was, mm -hmm. you know, it was a, it's an extraordinary book, and it was great. it was a terrific translation, and it had some of the kind of uh, the kind of roughness of language, you know. I mean, it was it, it, it was it was a, it was a book that was about bad things happening a lot of the sure. time, and he didn't have, he didn't you know he didn't have a problem with that. So it wasn't a bodlerized book, and we liked that very much, and. But Eamon, you know, the, the name of Eamon Carr has to, has to appear when, when you talk about the town because he really did an awful lot of the work. Uh, and he, uh, we would all have had a, a, a shared knowledge of the Kinsler thing and it would have had, it would have had a, a resonance with us. The, the kind of stuff that we're, Jim's been talking about and that we're reading in the notes here, Eamon did a lot of that research and you know, brought, mm. brought it to us. Mm. Uh, and so... The Kinsler thing was there as a as a kicker on, yeah. but the actual um, and and I, I suppose it's important to point out at this stage that Eamon, Eamon uh, was already a, a, a practicing poet, uh, and he and Peter Fallon uh, were uh, were actually publishing a broad broadsheet called the Book of Invasions and Capella, and they published 
they, they published so many young poets. Uh, I think I think they, uh, Seamus was in one of their uh, one of the broadsheets, and so the you know one element of, that made the time our album the time kind of interesting was that excuse me it came out of a kind of a literary it came out of a, a literary side of things not necessarily initially a, a musical yeah. side of things because yeah. the thing to remember is we were we were a bunch of country lads there, there was only one dub <coughs> yeah excuse me. Well, there was only one <laughs> one dub but he wasn't even a proper dub because his mum and dad were from belfast and and yeah, jay Common. Russ Common, yeah. respectively <laughs> and jay so we and, and we didn't know any other musicians in dublin so and it was also our first band so we kind of we did know them they just wouldn't talk to us I was <laughs> <laughs> well i was going to ask you what uh, to set the context a bit about the time like what was dublin like musically and and what was the atmosphere in which you appeared uh, well it was i, I mean uh, every almost everyone in this room is too too young to remember <laughs> <laughs> But there were a lot of uh, uh, the musical scene. Music scene in Dublin. There was a lot of tennis clubs, and there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of basements in in Leeson Street. But rock. That's where rock bands played. They and they tended to play uh, covers. I mean, they tended to play real good blues. But it was it was blues covers. I mean, Paul Brady was down there uh, playing with it was Cult, I think. Yeah. Um, and and uh, and they played. They basically played blues, uh, and so that, and and so most of the guys who would have been our age, who'd have been you know in a band, would have had an apprenticeship playing blues, and yeah. so they would have they would have learned that that was a relatively doable form of music. But even at that, there weren't that many, there weren't that many beat groups as they were known at the time. Going, I mean, like. Um, now there's there's a, ba a, ba a band in every garage and there's a couple of bands in every school and it wasn't at all like that because for a start you couldn't afford the gear guitar electric guitars were expensive you know acoustic guitars were around the place all right but you know it was it was still kind of coming in and it, it really hadn't become anything like as universal as music is now and like readily accessible and it was yeah it, it wasn't it wasn't a kind of mainstream pursuit um mm -hmm. I mean, there was there were there was a there was a there was a, a career path for Irish groups at that time. You you got to the top of the greasy pole here, and then you went to London, and you signed a deal with Decca, and you lived in a basement <coughs> of porridge for six months, and then they put out a single or one album, and then you went home again. And it was yeah, well, it was that was the ones who got out, and so that you know that. But I mean, you were, broke all the rules, didn't you? I just uh, do you remember the story of, of uh, was it Henry McCullough's band when they first went to London? They were living in the van, but the van had holes in the roof, and and so a couple of them would sleep under the van, and the, the ones who were asleep, they had to park it under a railway bridge <laughs> if it was wet. <laughs> That was era apparent. Yeah. I mean, there were, you know, there were bands like Granny's Intentions who were a really fine band, but they were doing same, very well. Same thing, they actually did well. Yeah. Same thing happened to them a bit. That everybody ended up back here, and we had no intention of letting that happen. Although that's slightly later in the story. Yeah. Uh, but when so when 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 we sort of start uh, started playing, I mean, it was really it was Rory Gallagher who was kind of, mm. the, you know, had made it. And there was there was Tin Lizzy who were who are off in London on that particular path, but who are smart enough to not release the one album and then come home. They mm. actually, they, they did a bit. And there was kind of, and, and there were bands like Elmer Fudd, um, you know, or, or rock bands, uh, and, and, but they also played in a very limited circuit. And we knew none of them. I mean, we, you know, we, we, were, we were all in... Complete outliers. Uh, yeah, we, we were yeah. in the Comic the Mecta with you. <laughs> <That's> so, <laughs> well, isn't that where the... the uh, <coughs> I was going to ask where the genesis of the thorn came from, because you'd already had success with the first album, with Happy to Meet, mm. bef when the, the thorn album came out, but I'm assuming that there was stuff happening before the album was finally It was Sean O'Brien, um, who was the, the main... Uh, the main man in the Cummins Army in UCD, um, in UCD yeah. um, had he came to us. I, mean, I think we had, had we had we moved on from the Cummins at that stage. We might have. I think um, I'd been fired. 
<laughs> I, I think I, 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 I ought to point out that <coughs> in the Commons of Mierta in UCD, Jim was the star uh, and I was a, a stage manager. And it, it, there was a one-act play that Jim starred in. And the only thing I ever had to get was a door, wherever we were, with, that you could push letters through. And on one occasion, I was such a bad props manager that I got a door without a thing you could push <laughs> letters through. And so at, at the moment, <laughs> the moment in the middle of the play, when the revelation that was going to change Jim's life happened, a bunch of letters fluttered over the top of the door. <laughs> And I was fired. And I think, I have a feeling that it was Diren who took over <coughs> my job. <laughs> Although she was also a star. Of course I was. But <laughs> Sean O'Brien was a big part of that common Dramaeta thing. And he, he, he really wanted, Jim was also treading the boards in the Wakefield Mysteries. Is it oh Lord that is going to betray me? <laughs> is it then I should do that deed? Oh, that was going <laughs> Oh, my God. And so, so there was a, a, thespian, a thespian aspect to but all it of was, it. It was the guy who, who came up with the, all the ideas in, in that group, Sean O'Brien, who had yeah. a plan that, that ultimately came to nothing. But yeah, because Cucullin got laryngitis. And it turned out <laughs> that appeared, that was actually what happened. It was, it was planned for the Abbey or the Peacock. And um, Barry McGovern told me then years later that he was he was supposed to be playing Ferdia. Where were the um, blonde locks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it was like it was it was a real thing and we had we had I can't remember exactly how much stuff we had done on it, but we had done some kind of preparatory work on it. Yeah. And then after Happy to Meet being a kind of grab bag of stuff that we'd been doing for the first year or eighteen months um, or more maybe. Uh, that was like that was a, 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 a sort of picture of where we had got to by that, that stage. And then after that, having used up all our material, we thought we'd better do something else. And I think it was Eamon again who said, why don't we look at what we did for the time? And, and then he started doing these lyrics. I think um, Eamon was able to say that because he had actually done some work for the time, <laughs> as opposed to talking about doing work for the time. But, but Barry, yeah. you wrote some of the lyrics for the poem. I well, did. I, I, I wrote, uh, eventually I wrote, I think, two or three songs. Yeah. Uh, I, and, um, Faster in the Hound's a gorgeous song. And, uh, and also, yeah. also the vehicle for, for possibly Johnny Finn's best solo. It's just the most gorgeous lyrical solo. Yes, yeah, it's good. It's right. good. Well, Johnny helped me with it as well, you know. And in fact, I, 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 full disclosure, Eamon wrote the lyrics. I wrote the I wrote the tune. Oh really? I yeah, thought, yeah, I didn't yeah. realize no, that. I, oh. I, I wrote the middle. How ages. little I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Barry, had you been you'd written other material before that, but had you always had it in your head that you would like to be a songwriter? Me? Yeah. I I, I always had it in my head that I would like to be a rock star. Well, and, uh, okay. The, 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 the we'll manage that. Yeah. The, the, the bit <laughs> in between, I. Uh, I hadn't worked out, and in, <laughs> indeed, I'm still trying to figure out how it happened. I mean, I was, I was famously the least cool member of the band because I just spent my whole time on stage going, how did I get here? <laughs> Look at this. How did I get here? You know, while, while Charles O'Connor's wandering around being <sighs> ultra cool. You know, this isn't happening, man. And I'm going, Look at me. <laughs> but so, what I'm getting to is when it came to the town, uh, because you did write a couple of songs in it, and... Um, the, the, the task of having to write lyrics to fit in an already existing story. Mm -hmm. Have you any memory of whether that presented a challenge or did you just... Well, it's, it, it, uh, can I patronise you a bit by saying that's a really good question? <laughs> because uh, it, <coughs> th it, that we, we had to figure out how we told the town mm -hmm. in terms of lyrics and times of words and music. And we obviously couldn't go and then Coo Cullen grabbed a sword and ran for <laughs> da 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 sword. Uh, actually, maybe we should have done that one. <laughs> but, uh, so, so you had, to, you had to find moments that were, that both uh, sort of were key moments in, in the action, in the narrative, but yeah. that were also key psychological moments. And Eamon was very good at that, you know, uh, a song like Charolais, uh, yeah. uh, you know, or uh, Time to Kill, Now We've Got Time to Kill. Um, that Jennifer Johnson used in... in uh, as the title, as the title. Yeah, yeah. Shadow of Skin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, so, uh, my... I suppose the songs that I wrote were, uh, were more, uh, you know, explanatory, uh, expository. The Eamons were 
more, in many ways more metaphorical, you okay. know. But well, in order to let people judge, could we hear a little blast of Ferdia's song? Because that's the one that I was thinking of, and that is part of the narrative. It's the encounter yeah. between Ferdia and <coughs> Mulholland. So, uh, James, if you have it there, great. his golden hair everything I do is ringed about with fantasy but Ferdia just laughed shook his silver spear and fell to battle Measured out in centuries, Ferdia just laughed and shook his golden mane. I must make my stand, for your death is my destiny. But Ferdia just laughed and shook his silver spear and fell to battle. I'd, I'd love that line, every step I take is measured out in centuries. <coughs> well done. Interesting what, what you're saying about the challenge of, of doing lyrics to fit a situation like that. Uh, a case in point was, uh, is it Cook Collins' Lament? Is uh, You Felt the Chill at Midnight Ice? Um, which was a piece that we had it was a, a setting that I had done of a Stevie Smith poem called Not Waving But Drowning. So it was, um, nobody heard him, the dead man, still he lay moaning. I was too far out all my life and not waving but drowning, which is a wonderful poem. Um, and uh, we liked the music and it seemed to fit with the kind of mood of how the poem was developing as we were working on various bits and pieces. And Eamon so went went to work and uh, did this great lyric, uh, and uh, and that was that was purely purely done to fit to fit the, the task in hand. And they, sorry, the, the 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 other thing about uh, because we must relentlessly talk about my work. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the other the other thing about the track we've just heard is that extraordinary riff, da, da, mm. and that's. Johnny Fian's mm. incomparable yeah. ability to amazing. put yeah. together a riff and to drive that band along. And his wife, Maggie, is here tonight. And oh. Maggie, thank you for coming along. Mm -hmm. He was a, a, a truly extraordinarily Stunned talented together. musician, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, uh, <laughs> well, he, I mean, uh, not just on the time, but on all the work we did. Yeah. It was it was a great yeah. thrill to, to work with Johnny. He was uh, he was always he was an extremely uh, affable bandmate, but like he was a killer when it came to playing yeah. the guitar and playing yeah. you know playing riffs. And just <laughs> hearing hearing that again, just hearing the guitar sound on it, it's just glorious. It's yeah, fabulous. Yeah. It is, isn't it? Wow. Um, you did you kind of drip feed the songs uh, ahead of the album? Was like. Dar of Doom was released earlier than the actual album was, was released. Had you completed the, the whole story at that stage when you released Dar of Doom, or was Dar of Doom independent of it, or can you remember? God, release dates now is something that's beyond me. Well, I came across that information somewhere. It mm. might be hey. inaccurate. <laughs> but then what I had for breakfast yesterday is, is very much beyond <laughs> me. <now. clears throat> um, no, but I wondered, because some of, them, some of the material um, you were performing already. Well, of course, you never did a, a, an actual. While it was a concept album, mm. you didn't do an actual poem show. No, we never. We never did a full. Although we had. When did we have the the, the, the beasts that spewed fire? 
Was that for the town or was that oh, for that Brooklyn was Invasion? For invasion. Oh, okay. No, we well. never, you, 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 we never, we, we wrote it, we wrote it fairly fast. I mean, we didn't have, we didn't have, we didn't have a lot of time to put together albums. You know, we, we, we had six weeks in, in September, between September and, and early November uh, to write, record and um, post-produce our albums and then we were back in the ballroom. So, yeah. so we, we were, you know, it was, uh, <coughs> would you mind writing a couple of hit tunes? Thank you very much, sir. And we went, yeah, no, we'd do that. And so we were working, we very much worked to, uh, to a, a, a schedule. Yeah. But I think Jerry Doom was, was earlier uh, than, you know, I think yeah. things like, say, fa fast, Faster Than The Hound, yeah. and, uh, they would have, they would have been in that compressed bit, and certainly uh, Ferdy's song was a song that was written quite close to the recording date because we needed we needed a Ferdy and uh, Thingy, uh, mm -hmm. Colin uh, um, song. So I think that was I think that's how that worked. Uh -huh. It was glorious to record. I mean, I'm just as I as I listened to different tracks over the last while, just uh, to get reacquainted with it, I, I was reminded of the process because we did. We went across, we did the backing, we recorded the backing tracks in Escape Studios in Kent, uh, which was, what's his name? Jeff Beck's studio. And um, did a, week or, a week, or, week or two down there and then went and did the rest in the manor, uh, Richard Branson's studios in Oxford. Uh, and that was just glorious. Awesome. That was an amazing experience. It was a, it was a residential <laughs> studio. It was 24 hours of that wretched excess, really. <laughs> but the other thing that I think probably everyone has heard this story, but it, it, it bears retelling. We, I mean, you know, we, <coughs> we worked to quite, we started late and worked till four or five in the morning. And there was a, a little fella, I mean, genuinely a little fella, in a, in a, in a, in a wife beater who, who swept up uh, the studio and sort of tidied it up and he had an awful sort of array an awful array in both senses of the word of really bad musical instruments lining the walls <laughs> ma mandolins with you know banana necks and we kind of went oh, poor lad, I don't know what what he thinks he's doing you know he's yeah. obviously the cleaner and about six days in Johnny came up and went um I think you better go down and listen, listen to what that lad's playing. It was Mike Oldfield. And wow. The, uh, <laughs> wow. And, and the, the thing he was doing while we were in our beds asleep in the morning was tubular bells. Wow. And, uh, wow. So we went down and we were greatly chastened. Um, <laughs> and I, I remember the day uh, Vivian Stansall Smith wandered up uh, to, to put the voices on. Tubular bells. Yeah. I mean, so it was... And, and uh, it was it was an extraordinary thing to be happening at the same time as, as, as what, we were doing our incidents. When I went digging in my vinyl collection, for which I no longer have a player, uh, for this the other <coughs> day, you know what was next to it? No. There are bells. No. Yeah, in the in the cupboard, un, untouched for spooky. years. There yeah, you go. <laughs> um, oh, wow. What about your audience? Did you? For, like nowadays, the amount of data that's collected on all of us—if we so much as breathe at the computer—back mm. then, you you oh, you knew the audiences. You got to know the audiences who were coming. Could you have predicted what their response would be to this kind of a concept album, or to bringing in this whole new stuff, or did you care? I, we cared deeply. I mean, we <laughs> cared deeply for every member. Of person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, except for young Master Hanrahan, who I think is a sort of a, a bit of a rival. He's down there somewhere. How are you, Mike? Um, uh, yeah, we, 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 we didn't know who our audience was. You know, we had... Did you worry? It, we would have very much work. liked to have had an awful lot of people buy the album so I could buy a big car. Yeah, we, that, that, that was certainly a worry. No, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being flip. We wanted to make the best album, we absolutely the best album we could. And we really did. And the, the, the great thing about the town is that we weren't technically entirely ready to do it. Um, I, I think I speak for myself. <laughs> <laughs> can cut me but in there, yeah. it is the sound of a band <laughs> overreaching itself. And, uh, you know, by the time we came to do the Book of Invasions, mm. we were able to play what we wanted to play in a way that, even though we managed it, you yeah. can, there's something about the, the, the town that's really 
I listened back to it and go, how, how, did, I, how did we do that? You know, one, um, a year before, I was playing air guitar with a Hurley, you know, and, <laughs> and, 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 it, and we, you know, we had this album, that, you know, that we were producing ourselves, that we'd done, we did all the artwork that featured body parts of Charles O'Connor. That's Charles' fist yeah. up there. Yeah. Thank God we never did that 13th album. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows where we'd have got to. But, <laughs> but like you were placing a lot of trust, well, in fate, I suppose, in many ways, because it was it was risky stuff. I think we kind of didn't like know. I mean, like what we were yeah. saying earlier on about not having had an apprenticeship um, on the R&B circuit or whatever, it, yeah. you know, uh, counted for that here, uh, meant that we didn't we didn't know all the things you weren't supposed to do or the things you weren't supposed to be able to do. And listening to this again, uh, it seems to me, a lot of the stuff on it seems to me musically kind of pretty eccentric. Um, <laughs> really, I mean, like there's stuff, why would you do that? But it kind of works. But there's lots of, there's lots of angular key changes and chord changes, like on Charolais, the, the verse and the chorus are in two different keys on this key, there's like just jumpy kind of chord changes yeah and it's not it's not rock and roll and i remember uh o o Duffy, alan o'duffy when we were recording it he was the producer he was the producer yeah, yeah. and we, we sort of we 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 got ourselves in as co-producers because uh but he was he was very he was very forgiving <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he was also great for us because he kind of got because his dad had been michael o'duffy oh, the yeah. irish tenor the rising of the moon That's right. um so he kind of knew the territory. But um, I, I remember on, on Charlie, he was trying to get us to do a backbeat because it didn't have a natural built-in backbeat. So <coughs> he, was, he was aware of kind of constraints like that that we had to kind of work around. And he contributed a lot of um, skeletal sort of stuff. Right. Um, but there were, yeah, I, I, I think we tried things that we didn't know you shouldn't even be able to be trying to. And because of that, I think that gave it a kind of jagged and angular individualism that I th yeah. think we... Yeah, I think that's well, right. Well, you know, yeah, that's sometimes right. I listen to it and I, I can see in my mind's eye you lepping around with your flute and your whistle <laughs> and the keyboards and let's put this here and let's put yeah. that here. And I think at the end of that track that we heard, I think <laughs> it's one of these tracks, it's either that or Derek Doom, has three key changes in about 30 seconds towards, yeah. towards the end. Yeah. Um, so you were having fun yeah. Yeah. from anything yeah, yeah. else, weren't you? And we did, you know, we did, we, we nicked things, of course, and we were all, you know, uh, the two, the, genuinely the two influences, big influences were Sean O'Reilly and the Beatles. And uh, on the time, we nicked the bit at the end from Rain, I think it is, with the Beatles, yeah. where we ran it backwards. And if you, if you, uh, if you run it, you know, Front if you can manage to me, I run it <laughs> forward. It actually says, Paul, we're really sorry for nicking this from you. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, of course, it doesn't. But uh, <coughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recipe for a really good Christmas pudding. <laughs> <laughs> but you're Speak, supposed to speaking be. of Aria, I have to give a, 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 a name check to uh, what I, a, a book that I think uh, speaks a lot to what was going on at the time you were saying earlier on, what was, what was Ireland like at the time, or what was Dublin like at the time. Uh, Dave Fanning's older brother, John, did a PhD thesis some years ago, and he, last year he turned it into a book called, um, excuse me being so snothery, I'm just getting over a head cold, um, called The Musician, The Mandarin, The Musician, and The Mage. And, the mage. and it's about a trilogy, a, a, a triumvirate of um, uh, T.K. Whitaker, who was Secretary of the Department of Finance, um, Thomas Kinsler, who did the translation of the poem, who was T.K. Whitaker's secretary in the Department of Finance, and Sean O'Reilly, uh, who, when he came to Dublin first, stayed in um, Kinsler's flat in Bagot Street, and the pair of them were up till three and four in the morning, smoking endless cigarettes and listening to Mahler and being very, be, being very serious. And so, John Fanning's thesis is, is that uh, between 1956 and 1966 you had something that was comparable to the Celtic revival in 1890-1910 uh, with uh, 
Douglas Hyde and Yeats and Lady mm -hmm. Gregory and mm -hmm. Singh and the rest of them. Uh, and that uh, Whitaker laid the economic ground because Ireland was going down the tubes economically and socially to the point where a lot of people uh, were saying we would have been better off. S uh, hardcore nationalists were saying maybe we'd, we'd have been better off sticking with the empire and staying mm -hmm. as part of Britain. Mm -hmm. It was like really, really dire. Uh, there were unemployment marches, people were streaming off the keys going to Coventry. And um, Whitaker effectively single-handedly turned it around uh, by introducing economic planning. He got La Masse on side, um, they got De Valera out of the way up to the park. And um, that laid the economic foundations for uh, Oria that then came along in 1960, 1959, he wrote Misha Era, wrote the, music, the, the music for the film Misha Era, and that was like, uh, we didn't have the term at the time, it was a river dance moment. Every, the mm. scales fell from everybody's eyes, and uh, everybody heard Irish music in a completely new way, because before that, you couldn't, you couldn't give it away. Uh, and it was like really looked at, it was, that was a tune the old cow died of, Jesus. Um, <laughs> And then um, Whitaker came along in 69, not Whitaker, Kinsler came along in 69, I think, and with Labrocki and the stylish presentation of it uh, with this new un version of the poem. I said, holy God, that's what's going on in the midst of this serious stuff here. Mm -hmm. So like that was, that was the, the favorable ground that we kind of found ourselves in. We were only a couple of years after that. And so like we were... Yeah picking low-hanging fruit in a way, you know? Yeah, there was a moment around that time, towards the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, where, in a way, anything was possible. In, in a peculiar way, I mean, I hear my kids talk about the dark days that they think I grew mm. up in. Yeah. And I'm thinking, it didn't feel like that to me. I mean, it <laughs> would have been if I'd been on an emigrant boat, of course it would, mm. and there was terrible mm. poverty and all of that. But culturally, it, it began to spark a bit around yeah. that time, yeah. didn't it's, it? It's only recently, you know, watching Reeling in the Years, uh, <laughs> that, that I've, I, I discovered that we came out of college at the time of one of the worst economic depressions yeah. Ireland had ever been in. Yeah. And, you know, I was kind of going, what will I be? Will I be, what will I be? I'll be something, yeah. I'll be something extraordinary. What will it be? Will Never. I be handsome? Will I be rich? Yeah, will <laughs> I be? <laughs> None out of two ain't bad. But, <laughs> but I mean, there was, uh, so the, there, was, there was that. There was a strong sense that anything was possible that I think was because of the, the, that Whittaker-driven, you know, yeah. we're, we're moving yeah. into a new era. There was also, Dublin was much more of a village. Uh, and well, certainly, again, at the level you're talking about, if you're, if you're in a certain, a certain way of Me going. Too. And, yeah. you know, they, when, when I went to UCD, <laughs> it was the year Breton Behan died. He was, you know, but he, would, he had been alive up to them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Come back, you're forgiven. I think ipso facto. Yeah, that's a fact. But uh, Flan O'Brien was still alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and Patrick uh, so, wasn't long so, and, and I remember, I think in 1967 or 68, it being in a in a house in around Pembroke Road, and Luke Kelly singing Raglan yeah. Road with yeah. my sister Mary and Seamus and Elaine McKillen and, and there was a you know a, a Kavanaugh wasn't long dead so there was a yeah. kind of a poetic literary village that was the last mm. vestiges of the Bagatonia thing and there was a new thing coming out of that and we did feel very strongly that for better or worse, or, yeah. you know, whatever yeah. fantasy it was we had, that we, were, that we were part of that and that there was a new time coming. Since I mentioned a second ago so many people who had to emigrate, you, they were all, by then, gone to England and America and wherever, and you toured the time in, or, or the material was mm. part of your tour <coughs> in the UK, in 74, I think, which wasn't a nice time to be floating around in, in yeah. England for an Irish person. It wasn't the best. Can you remember what that was like and what kind of response you got to the work? We never had any bad vibes. No, it was extraordinary. I yeah. mean, uh, we had to cancel a gig in Guildford because it had been blown up a fortnight earlier. We played Birmingham a week and a half after the, the blew up really? Birmingham. Uh, and by and large, well, not by and large, no one ever said, 
go home. I mean, yeah. we, and we were clearly an Irish, an Irish trad band. We represented a bunch of, of Irish tropes. And trading know. as that. Oh, come on, and if anybody had seen the posters, they wouldn't have thought that. Yeah. <laughs> in the gear. No, we haven't right. discussed yeah. the gear. We'll yeah. talk about that in a moment. But yeah, anyway. yeah, but I mean, but what we played, you know, I mean, it was, it was all fiddle and whistles and it was yeah, clearly yeah. Irish based. But you, and you nobody ever, no, no, nobody ever gave us a hard time. Mm. And we weren't, we didn't play particularly Irish venues. We never we, played we, Irish venues. We didn't, we no, played. Neither, neither, in, neither in, in Britain nor in the States or Canada. Like we steered, we, it's not that we steered clear of them, we didn't. We didn't court that audience. I mean, yeah. we didn't play Irish, like the Minnesota Irish Festival or anything like that. No, never at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so they, they, you know, the, uh, we, yeah, we, we, we were largely a college band in both England and, and right. in Germany. Okay. And yeah, that was, that was pretty much what we were. And so we had, uh, w we, we, we were a rock band that used traditional as our, as a, the, we were a fusion band. We saw ourselves prog rock band yeah. who used traditional music mm -hmm. as the prog bit, yeah. and so we, we we always positioned ourselves because that's what we were as a as a rock band. So there, there was one weird night, not weird night, but there was there was uh, there was one night we were we were we used to stay in a house in the centre of uh, extremely swish Belgravia um, around the week. We'd wander around for late breakfast in Sloan Square, wow. um, and you couldn't you couldn't even park your car there now. I mean, it's uh, mm. and uh, so we used we used to take a whole house. It was doable then because short lets had only just started to come in, and um, we arrived back from a gig somewhere miles up the M1 um, uh, at I don't know four in the morning, five in the morning, and uh, not long afterwards there was big banging on the door, and it was the CID because this truck, uh, an anonymous truck with Irish registration was outside and, they, <laughs> and it looked very dirty for a very swish address. <laughs> and so they stormed in and dragged a lot of very smelly hats uh, <laughs> out of their beds. Uh, and, uh, but that was the only thing. And, and th then they realized it's just a band and they went away and they're yeah. just stoned hippies. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about Allegedly. Which. Talking of which, we have it. <laughs> I'm, I'm conscious of the time because we were asked to finish uh, at nine if we could. But, and I'd like to give you people a chance to ask a question or two. But, like, I'm not going to go through the wardrobe choices for the entire duration of the life <laughs> of horse lips. But when it came to the time and the design, Charles's designs and stuff were fantastic. So, it were, you, you were open to really doing anything, like wearing anything or, or yes. whatever. Was, yes. was no, we had no sense, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I Nobody. think everyone in the room knows <coughs> that Cavendish's soft furnishings on Grafton Street closed down <laughs> after we changed, it, stopped using them as our outfit suppliers. <laughs> uh, we, had, we had a seamstress called Jackie McNeil, who was a wonderful, wonderful dress maker, yeah. and Charles designed them. And you know, I th I figure from the stuff I that I wore, he never really liked me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're wonderful! I love looking at the old photographs. They are truly bizarre, but they were bizarre at the time as well, and they worked. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Why not? Um, I think we might. Um, yeah, I think we should because we were asked to finish not long after this. If you could bring up the house lights, and there are microphones I think will be scattered amongst you <coughs> and anybody who might have a question to ask will be welcome. Thank you for and if you could bring the spots down a bit yeah. here. Yeah. Thank you. If we could bring down these spotlights a bit so that we can see you that would also be helpful if anybody's in a position to do that. If not we'll manage. So yes there's a question here in the front. This man here, and then is there one behind as well? Yeah. Okay. Thank Evening, you. lads. You're looking great after 50 years. Well done. Um, <laughs> and we've, we've never met, isn't that? Right? <laughs> 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 we've never met, Dad. <laughs> 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 With bands in the 1970s being accused of um, having covert demonic messages in their albums if you played them backwards. Uh, were you ever accused of having demonic messages in your band? And if not, would you like to have been? <laughs> well, you know, Jim, Jim, Jim had, a, had a big wizard coterie in, 
Oh, wow. yeah. In Oakland, uh, in San Francisco, um, there was there was a, co a coven, not a coven. Um, what's what's the male version of a coven? Uh, anyway, there was there was there was a, 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 a druid. It was a druid. He was a druid. Stephen Warren Abbott, um, <laughs> and um, he he used to come to our gate. He he used to come to when we when we when we did um, uh, in store an in store in a brilliant record shop in Berkeley called Rather Ripped, uh, run by a lovely lovely guy called uh, uh, Doug Crawl, who we're still in touch with, uh, and uh, Stephen couldn't come to gigs because he had asthma. And so there were, everybody was smoking at gigs in those days. Um, and so he used to come to the record store. And once I went out to the house, and so Stefan was a druid, and uh, he, was, he was a member of the reformed druids of North America. And they had, they had a breakaway sect um, of Jewish members called the reformed Hasidic druids of North America. <laughs> and they had uh, a book a printed book, which I had until some years ago, uh, which had their their um, seasonal ceremonies for Samhain and Bealtaine and Lunasa uh, in English with a facing translation in perfect Irish. Really? It was extraordinary. Um, and I went out to the house one night. I was invited out, uh, and there were a bundle of witches and uh, wizards and druids, um, genuinely. And he had an amazing Celtic library. And uh, downstairs in the basement, he had uh, a lot of little figures, like like sort of lead soldiers, uh, like Celtic warriors, uh, but also like comic figures. And I said, "That's peculiar. What's that? that that's barbarian duck." <laughs> <laughs> um, and and they had and uh, all sorts of wizardy stuff in glass cases, cups and chalices and swords and whatnot, uh, and very serious about it. So there was a kind of we had a bit of a following among um, magical, uh, witchcrafty, druidic types, particularly in America, and a few, I think, in England. Didn't seem to have that in Germany for some reason. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> but they were the good demons, not the bad ones. Yeah, yeah. And one hopes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for your question. Somebody there behind you. Hi, a couple of points about songwriting. Do you think that your decision to credit all songs to Horselips, as opposed to Lockhart Fane or? Devil in a Corner, do you think that increased the longevity of the band and saved bickering? And also, in latter years, like the Beatles, although the songs remained Lennon McCartney, you could tell who, who actually was, both by the kind of song and who sung it. Is that the case with your songs, where the singer may, might have a, a greater influence in it? Well, Jim wrote a lot of songs. I mean, Jim wrote uh, Furniture, the first song we ever, we ever performed, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, and that remained <coughs> stable till the end, till the end of our playing time. Uh, but he, he didn't, uh, Jim s uh, sings very well, but he, he didn't sing furniture. So, th no, there isn't a correlation between who sings and who wrote. I mean, Johnny, Johnny sang uh, I'll Be Waiting, but I wrote that uh, in, on a particularly wet Sunday in the Great Northern <laughs> Hotel in Bundoran, and it reflects every, every dreary <laughs> raindrop on the window. Um, so so, so there, there, there isn't a, an, a, an absolute correlation between singer and, and writer. Uh, well, one of the things that we always did was we, we attributed everything to everybody. Um, and that was partly a, kind of a, 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 an, upper, an, a, an economic thing so that everybody got the same out of, the, uh, you know, reward for what we did. But it also meant that you didn't have a row about, you know, why hasn't the bass guitarist got two songs, you know, when the actual talented <coughs> member of the band is seven. So, the, <coughs> so it, it, it was a bit of low self-interest and a bit of philanthropy in a way. So that, that's the second half of your uh, question. How are you, by the way? You're well. <laughs> uh, and but, wh but what he was asking was, did it contribute to the longevity of the band, the fact that there weren't kind of egos popping up, I presume is what you mean, to, to take credit for particular songs? Yeah, the fact that you were yeah probably. Yeah, fair because, I mean, we never, we never even... Yeah, it, never, it was never an issue. So stuff, so material would, would, would make its way through the sausage machine on merit, hopefully. 
Yeah, I mean, it was one of the... Uh, they're, 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 they are having their, their own little gig tonight in Las Vegas, but uh, <laughs> uh, you too will, will happily tell you, if you ask them, that they adopted that business model from us because Paul McGuinness was Michael Deaney's friend and, and business partner uh, early on. In fact, the reason we signed with Michael Deaney, our manager, was because he and Paul McGuinness had put on a festival in the RDS in September 1912. Uh, <laughs> and and, and oh. with a, Georgie Fame and Alan Price were the, the lead acts in Manfred Mann's Earth Band, and we were on it. And they were, Michael was very impressed with the fact that he liked what he saw, and so he asked us if he could manage us. And we said, no, you can't. We're looking for a proper manager, not, not a... <laughs> Not a fellow who's younger than us and wears a fur coat. But we eventually came around to it and worked out great. But Paul and Michael have remained friends to this day. And the, the big thing that Michael said to Paul was, uh, make sure that everybody in the band uh, 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 has an attribution on all the, on all the, on all the, on all the tracks. Very interesting. Um, I've been over that side of the house. Are there any questions on this side of the house or not? There aren't, but there's one down here on this side. Yeah, last one, I promise. <laughs> yeah. So you've talked a little bit about selecting the moments from the saga that made it onto the album as songs or lyrics or whatever. Is there anything that didn't quite make it in, perhaps because of concerns about brevity or coherence that you would have really liked to bring in? There was one track, was, was, was the rights of man for the town or Book of Invasions? I think it was Book of Invasions. Was Book of Invasions. Book of Invasions. Mm. Miles, our, our <coughs> some, sometime drummer, could tell us which one was it for, Miles? Book of Invasions. Book of Invasions. Book of Invasions. There you go. We, we, we basically got our hands on it. <laughs> but we, we tended to use everything that, you know, we, 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 we didn't have a lot of stuff left over, let's put it like that, uh, and which, is, which is why uh, the More Than You Can Chew compilation amazes me because, you know, I, I, I didn't realise we had that much stuff hanging about. Uh, if, if I'd known that, I'd have put out another album. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it, it's something we did. You know, there, there are people who have, you know, there are bands who have loads and loads and loads of, of songs that they've... Part, part of the kind of uh, e economy of that was that we, we did record an album a year and we really didn't have the time to write more than the eight or ten songs that you could put on an album. And of course, back then, you could only put ten songs in an album yeah. because mm -hmm. the grooves yeah. ran out if you put on more. So you got a quieter album, the fewer tracks. Uh, this was before steam engines, where you're much <laughs> too young to know anything about this. But I mean, there were, there were, there were those kind of constrictions and constraints, uh, and we, we observed them keenly. You were particularly good about the constraints, <laughs> I didn't think. didn't have much choice, um, because I remember there was always huge debate when we got an album done. Like, this, all, the, all the talk about how wonderful vinyl was, people don't realise the amount of messing with the sound quality that had to happen before it got transferred onto vinyl. It got, had to get compressed and remastered and really distorted from what came out of the studio. So what you hear on vinyl isn't by almost by definition what came out of the studio um, and one of the things that we were always hugely exercised about was the the level that came out of the speakers um, and to and if you did a 22 minute album instead of a 26 minute album you got a louder album um, so it's there was odd sort of constraints like that um, although we didn't realize that you didn't necessarily get a better album. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, was, there, was, there was that. There uh, is that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on, oh, all right, one more. This is the last one then. Sorry, do you want to do, just Michael give him the mic? I've never met before. I give, think. No, yeah. give, give him the mic so the people at the back can hear his question. <coughs> we can hear you, but they may not. <coughs> Use the word always known as a Celtic rock group. Where do tracks of the vaults come from? You know, who's just totally way off the. Kells. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it was a demonic plot. It was actually, it was someone that Eamon, uh, <coughs> you know, Eamon had, 
had a, Eamon uh, was, had a terrific sense of stuff that would cause a, you know, a kind of a stir or get us a bit of notice. And tracks in the vault, it's essentially a bunch of B-sides and, and some early stuff uh, like um, Motorway Madness. And, um, and uh, he just liked the idea of it looking like a, 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 a games horror comic. And um, so it was the same kind of playful spirit on his part that, that made Jarek Doom be a... He was a Stan Lee fiend before it was profitable or popular, really. Uh, and so um, Jarek Doom is straight out of the Marvel franchise, but a bit before they really started to make money, <coughs> you know? <coughs> so, yeah, so that's where it came from. Okay, I think we'll have to leave it there because we've gone past the allocated time. Could I thank Barry and Jim most sincerely thank you. for, uh, yeah. for a great job. <laughs> and, um, and thank you for being such a good audience. I still cannot get my head around the fact that it's 50 years since this happened. Um, nor can I, well, let's not go there. It's just <laughs> unimaginable. Anyway, I think we'll finish with another big blast of music. So roll it there, James. Thanks, thanks. Ramil Mahogany. Thank you very much. <laughs> <Ramil Mahogany. laughs> Oh, yeah, I don't.